I want to talk a bit about SAMHSA's guidance for trauma-informed organizations. So SAMHSA's the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration, which created the original publications on trauma-informed care and trauma-informed organizations. And actually, all their publications are accessible for free on their website. You can download entire books they've written and compiled about trauma-informed care and organizations. And other videos on this channel and other chapters in this book really go through uh, SAMHSA's definition for trauma-informed care uh, in a more comprehensive manner. So if you haven't already looked at those videos, I encourage you to check out those videos uh, as well. So just as a very brief overview, SAMHSA talks about the four R's of trauma-informed care as a, an overview of the, the philosophy, essentially. First is that we realize Trauma has widespread and extensive impacts on individuals and communities, and that there's multiple pathways to recovery. Next, we recognize the symptoms of trauma and traumatic stress, how the past is showing up in the present for the individuals that we're working with or for ourselves. Third R is that we respond through policies, procedures, and practices. And the fourth R, is that we resist re-traumatization in all aspects of our work. So again, trauma-informed care was largely created based on the realization that organizations were unknowingly re-traumatizing the folks that they were trying to help and work with. So we need to be careful and make sure we're not causing any more harm through our organizations. And this means not just causing harm to the clients, community members we're serving, but also that we're not causing harm to the staff that we're employing. So these are the four R's of trauma-informed care. Then we have the six principles. We have safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and neutrality, empowerment, voice and choice, and issues of identity, culture, history, and gender. So these are the six principles of trauma-informed care. So trauma-informed organizations look at every aspect of their organization through the lens of these four R's and these six principles. And SAMHSA went as far as even providing and outlining 10 different agency domains that organizations can look at as they try to implement the six principles and the four R's in each of these 10 domains. So the 10 domains are one, governance and leadership, policy, physical environment of the organization, engagement and involvement, cross-sector collab collaboration, screening, assessment and treatment, training and workforce development, progress monitoring and quality assurance, financing, and number 10 is evaluation. So a trauma-informed organization takes each one of these 10 domains one at a time and critically reflects within that domain on how they're embodying these six trauma-informed principles and the four R's and how they can better embody those principles and those four R's. So becoming a trauma-informed organization takes work, takes energy, it takes humility. We have to be able to admit that we can be better and we must involve staff at all levels of the organization in order to help move the organization towards trauma-informed care. So this includes the leaders and board members, the management, the clinical staff, the administrative staff, operational staff, and all frontline staff. So becoming a trauma-informed organization has to be a top-down and a bottom-up process that everybody has to be on board with it. Because it can be so complicated to become a trauma-informed organization or to like take and operationalize these six principles, these four R's, into the real world, SAMHSA even created a 10-stage process that organizations can follow when they want to begin or continue their journey towards implementing trauma-informed care in their organization. And so these are the 10 steps. Number one, first we have to make a commitment to becoming a trauma-informed organization. So it's got to be a real conscious thing that we decide to do 
collectively as an organization. Second stage, we create some sort of infrastructure to begin support and guide the changes. So now that we've made a commitment, we have to create some sort of structure within the organization that's going to allow us to uh, implement change. Then we've got to involve participants from across the organization, clients, staff, and community members. Fourth stage, we assess the current policies in the organization, the current procedures and operations, and determine how much they aid or inhibit trauma-informed approaches. This is where we really have to be honest with ourselves about how we're helping or not being so helpful in implementing trauma-informed care. Five, we create a plan to further implement trauma-informed care in the organization based on the realizations we've had, the new insights we've developed. Sixth stage, we develop collaborations with staff, clients, community members, and other service providers from different sectors who can help support us and challenge us to be more trauma-informed. Seventh stage is that we have to follow through and actually put this plan into action. It's not enough to just talk about it in a board meeting or to have someone come in and do a short training on trauma-informed care. There has to be follow through. We have to put these ideas into action. We have to modify our policies, modify our procedures, uh, implement our training. Eighth stage, we reassess how the plan was implemented or not, how valid it was and how relevant it's been. And we have to keep continuously reassessing how are we doing and continuing to grow as a trauma-informed organization. Ninth stage is that we use different measures to improve the quality and effectiveness of our approaches to meet the needs of the staff and the communities that we're working with. So essentially, we're implementing some sort of uh, outcomes-based measures and evidence-based care. And number 10, that we implement practices that promote sustainability, including training, education, supervision, peer support, feedback, and the distribution of resources within the organization. So these are the 10 different stages that an organization can actively engage in in order to begin or continue their journey to implementing trauma-informed care. Uh, in one of the organizations that I've been a part of, what we did was we created a committee that involved the CEO, the clinical director, the medical director, a handful of therapists, supervisors, nurses, and other staff members. And this committee or task force met every week or every other week to talk about different ways of better implementing trauma-informed practices within the organization and trauma therapy within the treatment program. And so we got perspectives from all the different departments, from staff at all different levels. And at the end of each meeting, we made a, a list of things to do and delegated them to individuals within the committee. And in between meetings, we got stuff done. And there was some accountability for ensuring that when you committed to doing something, that you, you did what you said you were going to do and implemented it. So we were reassessing what was working, what was getting done, and what wasn't getting done at the beginning of each meeting. What were the action items from the previous meeting? And did we accomplish those? And if not, what were the barriers that got in place? So this is a simple thing that your agency, your organization can do to move through these 10 different stages and work towards becoming a trauma-informed organization. And this is relevant suggestions for any and all organizations. Trauma-informed care is something that any organization in any industry or discipline can benefit from. It's not just something that was created just for therapy um, or treatment centers or therapists. And every organization, no matter how trauma-informed they are, can always be better. So any organization can benefit from going through this process. So I wanna challenge you for a moment to pause and reflect on these 10 stages and consider which of these stages has your organization already engaged in, directly or indirectly, consciously or unconsciously? And which of these stages might your organization benefit from revisiting? To further help organizations implement trauma-informed care, SAMHSA also created 16 strategies 
that they published in their implementation guide for behavioral health administrators to consider when trying to become a trauma-informed organization. So 16 strategies, and we're going to go through them briefly here. Strategy one is to show organizational and administrative commitment to trauma-informed care. Number two, use trauma-informed principles within strategic planning of the organization. Three, review and update the vision, mission, and value statements within the organization. These are really concrete things an organization can do. Strategy four, assign a key staff member to help facilitate change. Make this a part of somebody's job description. Strategy five, create a trauma-informed oversight committee. This is a committee that's tasked with uh, the, the oversight or the responsibility of moving the organization towards trauma-informed care. Strategy six, conduct an organizational self-assessment of trauma-informed services. And there's multiple different ways of doing that. There's some formal assessment tools that can be done and other informal ways of, of self-assessing. Strategy seven, develop an implementation plan. Strategy eight is to develop policies and procedures to ensure trauma-informed practices and to prevent re-traumatization. Strategy nine is to develop a disaster plan in the event of crisis or disaster or some other form of violence or collective trauma within the organization. Strategy 10, incorporate universal routine screenings. So this is about evaluation and screening. Strategy 11, apply culturally responsive principles in our work. Strategy 10, use science-based knowledge. So this comes back to uh, outcomes and evidence-based practice. Strategy 13, create a peer support environment within the organization. Strategy 14, obtain ongoing feedback and evaluations. Number 15, change the environment to increase safety. This would be for not just community members and clients, but also for staff members. And finally, strategy 16, develop trauma-informed collaborations. So we have to uh, really implement all 16 of these strategies within our organizations, in addition to the 10 phases or stages outlined above. And these are basically a toolkit that SAMHSA has created for us to really guide us step by step on how to implement trauma-informed care within our organizations, to take these ideals, these principles, these philosophies, and in a real practical way, bring it into our organizations, into our environments, into our workplaces. So if you wanted to dive more into that, you can actually download SAMHSA's book, Trauma-Informed Care in Behavioral Health Services. It's uh, tip 57. You can get it for free on SAMHSA's website. And pages 161 to 171 go through these 16 strategies in more detail. So I want to challenge you for a moment to pause and reflect on these 16 strategies. Which of these strategies could your own organization benefit from revisiting? Which of these strategies do you feel like your own organization does a good job with? 